Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Papagianis. Uh, we have a terrific panel here with some incredible uh, thought leaders on policy. Uh, the title for today's panel is Big, Big Think Policy Ideas for America's Future. Um, I want to be very brief in setting up this panel so that we leave as much time, I'll try to get the mic right too, as much time as possible for uh, what I expect to be a lively uh, discussion. Uh, the goal for the conversation, uh, as I see it, is really twofold. Uh, we want to help spotlight uh, some of America's great challenges today, preview those that are on the horizon, but then also help flesh out some of the most attractive policy solutions. Policy is fundamentally about problem solving. It is, it is informed by principles and ideals, priorities and preferences. And to be successful, it must answer the real needs and concerns of our society and its economy. I, want to be very, I also want to be very brief in introducing our esteemed panel. I think all of you have their full bios in, uh, in your package. But uh, just very briefly, uh, going down the line this way, uh, Ovik Roy. Ovik is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. He is also the opinion editor at Forbes. Uh, he is also a columnist at National Review and a frequent guest on television news programs including Fox, MSNBC, CNBC, Bloomberg, and HBO. Uh, to his right is Kate Batchelder. Uh, Kate is an assistant editorial features editor at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, where she contributes unsigned editorials, profiles, and op-eds while also editing outside contributors. To her right is Josh Barrow. Josh Barrow is a correspondent at the New York Times, uh, where he writes for their politics and policy site Upshot. He is also a contributor on MSNBC, uh, and he has previously written for Business Insider and Bloomberg View. Should also mention he used to be a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute as well. Uh, to his right is Raihan Salam. Raihan is executive editor of National Review. Uh, he's also a fellow at the National Review Institute. He is a columnist for Slate and a contributing editor at National Affairs and an interviewer for Vice. Uh, in 2008, Raihan also was the co-author with Ross Douthat of the book Grand New Party. Uh, to the right of Raihan is Megan McArdle. Megan is a columnist at Bloomberg View. She writes on economics, business, and public policy. She has also been a correspondent for The Atlantic, The Economist, Newsweek, and regularly appears on TV uh, for MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR. She also published her first book last year, The Upside of Down, Why, why Failing Well is the Key to Success. Um, so I, I, wanna, I wanna begin the discussion sort of at a 30,000 foot level, and then we can dive down into uh, into the, the weeds, so to speak, and ask, uh, I guess I'll, I'll put the first question to, uh, to Raihan, but I'd like to hear from uh, some of the others as well. As we look out at 2016, what should the big debate in this next election be about? Not what will it be about, but what should it be about? Uh, I think it should be about something that everyone on this panel has written about and thought about long and hard, which is, thinking about the barriers to upward mobility. Um, you know, we tend not to be very rigorous when we talk about mobility. It can mean many different things. It can mean relative mobility. How does your social status change over the course of your life? Or relative to your parents, let's say. It can mean absolute mobility. But I think that there's a broad consensus on the left and the right that there are many people for whom uh, there isn't this sense of expansiveness. There isn't the sense that one can, uh, you know, definitely and reliably be better off than in the past. Uh, and I think that you know, all of us have approached that from a lot of different angles. Uh, you know, what are the particular fixations that we have? Ovik has done a lot of really great writing about institutional failures. Uh, Josh has thought a lot about things at the state and local level that are big barriers, not really federal issues, but that actually wind up having enormous implications for productivity and, and what have you. And you know, Megan you know, covers the waterfront. Uh, so I think that this is a very good and healthy <laughs> uh -huh. development because I think that, you know, the larger thing is that Republicans have been fixated on a certain set of issues for a really long time that, while important, are not actually essential to the particular mobility challenges we want right now. So my hope is that, at the very least, as we have candidates uh, you know, debating these big, big issues, that they try to draw attention to that stuff. 
Anybody else want to react yeah, to that? Yeah, well, I, I wholeheartedly agree with Ryan. I think that is the number one issue that, uh, that this election should be about. The second, I, I think second to that would be the deficit and the debt. Uh, and, and that's, of course, a more traditional issue in a lot of ways, particularly uh, in conservative circles. But I actually would argue that conservatives haven't thought rigorously about the drivers of the deficit and the debt. The reason why we have such a profound debt crisis is because actually it's mostly Republican voters who benefit from uh, the growth of the entitlement state. And I think few Republican politicians have been willing, in fact, no Republican politicians have really been willing, except possibly Paul Ryan, uh, to, to confront that issue and say, look, Republicans, if we really want to confront the debt and the deficit, we're going to have to pony up a considerable amount of the sacrifice. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, I think we're at a moment when both parties are exhausted and both parties don't have um, a clear agenda going forward. I mean, you look at what the, the Democrats, it's pretty clear at this point that what they're going to be talking about in 2016 is universal child care, which is um, nice, but it's not transformative and it, it almost seems like it's been chosen because it's the only thing we haven't tried and therefore right. it can be like the ginseng of public policy. It cures everything um, if you only take it in large enough doses. And Republicans similarly, you know, the era of Reagan is over. The era of Reagan is over because you cannot keep cutting taxes um, and spending a bunch of money on entitlements, right? To tax, to spend is to tax, is ultimately that's gonna have to be paid for either now or later, uh, but it has to be paid for. And Republicans have, have gotten away with um, focusing on the tax side and not really actually getting serious about the spending side. In part because I think, I, I see both parties as being like locked in a game of chicken where each party is trying to kind of lock in their preferences as much as possible, spend as much as possible, cut taxes as much as possible, and hope that when the crisis comes, the other guy is going to have to uh, make, the, make the cuts. Um, it's kind of like a game of chicken, except that, you know, like the winning strategy is you throw the wheel out the window, but both parties have now thrown the wheels out the window, and they're just kind of barreling headlong into not doing anything about the fundamental problem. If, if I can go to 60,000 feet for, for a second. <laughs> I, Do you have I, oxygen, Josh? Yes, uh, maybe. Uh, I sort of, I think there are like, there are three really big economic ch challenges facing not just the US, but most of the advanced world that nobody has really good ideas about how to address through policy. The first is that productivity growth has slowed down compared to where it was 40 years ago. And that flows through into slower real GDP growth and slower real income growth. And everybody's in favor of higher productivity, but it's really difficult to figure out what public policies actually lead to productivity growth. Uh, the second is that shifts in the economy have put workers in a worse position than they were 40 years ago in terms of receiving a smaller share of GDP um, as, as labor income. Um, some of that has to do with the fact that unemployment rates are above target much more often than they used to be. Um, we just got unemployment back down below 6% in the US after several years above that, but you know, if you look back over the last, the sweep of the last 40 years, it's actually been very common to be on above target unemployment. That puts workers in a position where it's hard to bargain for higher wages. And then the third is a demographic challenge, where basically because birth rates have declined, we're having a, a shrinking share of the population that is working age, fewer people working, supporting more people at ages at which they are generally net recipients of government benefits. Um, and I think part of the reason that the parties are exhausted, not just here, but I mean it's even worse in Europe, um, is that I think these challenges are often not very amenable to, to, to policy, mm -hmm. um, and certainly not very amenable to the policies that each party has constituencies that they desire to see implemented. And so I think it's a lot of futzing around. I think that's why you see the president out there talking about middle class economics with a uh, basically a slate of 50 very small bore policy ideas that wouldn't do that much to move the needle for the middle class. Republicans are still very focused on these broad ideas about you know, cutting marginal tax rates to incentivize um, economic activity, which whatever its effect on long run growth has no particular effect that I can see on that you know, cyclical stuff that has to do with the labor market. Um, and so I, th I think just, you know, the answers that people are in a position to provide don't go to those three big things because it's really not obvious always what the government can do about those big so, things. So uh, just, I, th I have a yeah. sense I may, uh, the conversation may come in your direction here. Um, I'm sensing a skepticism that uh, sort of tax reform, right, is, 
the panacea, right? Uh, from, I think, your perspective, Josh, maybe a little bit uh, came through in your comments, Megan, as we look towards uh, uh, 2016, that uh, sort of the traditional playbook, if you will, for those right of center, uh, that uh, there's not as much maybe mileage to be gained uh, in outreach to voters and uh, making the case uh, that uh, through rate cuts, uh, we're gonna see more long-term growth. Um, is that really a consensus um, um, uh, you know, across the panel or, or is there, is there a, a, some disagreement? I would have to disagree. I really think that the fact that we're at an event called the Adam Smith Society is a pretty good testament to good ideas don't expire. And I think that all of the talk of the era of Reagan is over and it's time to update and do something new is sort of overwrought in a sense because I do think that uh, tax reform uh, still has huge possibilities, specifically in uh, corporate tax reform and a 10% rate reduction. I mean, I still think that the economic benefits would be huge. And I do. I, am for, I don't understand the argument of it might work in the long term, but it doesn't work in the short term. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo uh, Kate's, uh, Kate on this. Uh, I, I think that there is actually an enormous opportunity to do high quality corporate tax reform in particular that would do a lot to lower corporate tax rates in the US, make them more competitive globally, and also just eliminate a lot of the compliance costs and inefficiency that come from uh, a complex tax code. Uh, that I, I, I would say that's not the only thing we should be focused on. I think uh, upward mobility and the debt are more important than corporate tax reform. But if it were the case that corporate tax reform, say, would be the one thing we could do together as a bipartisan thing, and that would be the thing that everyone wanted to agree on, great, let's do it. Uh, so there's, there's a policy need. I'm, I'm going to disagree here for a couple of reasons. So first of all, I should say that like my one of my very first blog posts, one that I still stand behind, was why we should eliminate the corporate income tax. I think we should get rid of it. It's a, it's a stupid tax. It's hard to collect. It generates huge compliance costs. There are other ways to collect that money in a way that's actually even more progressive than what we do. Um, that said, I recognize then and recognize now this is a political non-starter. People freak out when you start talking about it. And the problem with corporate tax reform at some marginal rate is that the complexity doesn't go away, right? If the rate's 15%, the, pro the complexity is not in the rate. The complexity is in what constitutes income. How are we, do we depreciate things? What's the schedule for X, Y, and Z? And that stuff doesn't go away if you cut the rate by 10%, and it, the rate is then still high enough. The corporations are really, really gonna care about gaming it, and you know, they're really, really gonna care about having arguments with the IRS about it and getting new rulings and all of the rest of it. Um, I, I, you know, you can lower the rate, and it, it might have, it would certainly have some impact on, uh, on dis corporate decisions to locate here. Uh, I think that doing away with ter with global taxation would actually be a better move on that front, rather than just trying to play with the marginal rates on the on right. the on global taxation, move to a territorial system like the rest of the world has. But, um, you know, in the long run, marginal tax cuts can certainly improve growth, right? You I mean you can. But in the short run, you lose more revenue than well, what, you gain. What about complexity, but, Megan? All, I, I, again, but all of that stuff, right? So, okay, so we get rid of the complexity and all of the accounting departments go away, right? What happens? It takes them a while to do something else. It doesn't happen next quarter. And unfortunately, the tax year happens in this quarter and, and presidential cycles happen in a cycle where it's actually hard to get enough revenue gains from a tax cut now. But the, that's the, not an the, argument the, the, for this not is, reforming. That's an argument for reform. In the sense well, it's so like, complicated. How, how the hell are we here on a panel about big think ideas for, <laughs> for the future? Of the, and we're talking about corporate tax reform. This is such a small ball issue. Whether the rate's going to be 35 <laughs> or 28 or 25. I mean, you can look. I mean, conservatives love to talk about other countries that do so much better on corporate tax than we do. Even though it, we have a hybrid system, everybody else has a hybrid system. It's not like we have this weird worldwide system and everybody else is doing the, this totally different thing. But also, if lower corporate tax rates are so great for, cor for, for economic performance, why is Western Europe, that has been cutting corporate tax rates for the last 20 years, doing you know, worse than we are over the last five and roughly the same over the last 20? Well, that's it's, not. So let's, it's, let's, but let's, this issue just isn't that well important. Out of that before. <laughs> Josh, Josh, <laughs> let's, let's, let's take your, your comment and yeah. use it as a pivot. Yeah. Um, uh, when I threw out the, the question to open the panel, uh, yeah. I asked what should the debate right in 2016 be about? We heard an answers from some of the panelists. 
you don't, you don't think it should be corporate tax reform, clearly. No. Um, uh, what should it be? I think it should be first about full employment. And the reason why we care about the short term is we're always in an economic cycle. On average, you have a recession, what, every eight years or something like that? So if, if the period of, slack, of a slack labor market coming out of the recession lasts for, on average, four years instead of two years, that's an enormous effect on everyday people's lives because it means spending half their life in a period when they are weak in their negotiations with an employer instead of spending a quarter of their life in that period. Um, and then I think the other thing it needs to be about is productivity, but I don't think anybody really has a clear idea about what improves productivity. Do What's one of the biggest drivers of economic it? growth? It's, yeah. it's, it's tax reform. So I, I don't think the tax reform is something you can ignore if you want to achieve economic growth and full employment. So, so I mean, one thing I just want to throw out is that there are things about culture that have implications for tax policy and much else and labor market policy more broadly. So for example, when we're looking at the tax rate, the elasticity of taxable income is different for different groups. So for example, if I'm a middle-aged uh, person, if I'm 45 years old, I have two kids and a mortgage, I, I might be less sensitive to the tax rate than if I'm 25 or if I'm right on the verge of retirement. And so when you look at larger demographic change, it actually has implications for how we ought to think about taxes. Or similarly, you know, there's this woman named Toby Herr who runs a nonprofit group called Project Match. And she's basically been working for the last 30 years to help people on welfare uh, enter the formal labor market to find full-time employment. And she's just done an exhaustive survey of all kinds of different schemes designed to get people into full-time work, including really generous uh, programs with lots of counseling, child support, everything, things that you don't generally see in your run-of-the-mill uh, you know, program. And what she's found is that you know, pretty much no matter what, you have about half of people transition reliably to full-time work. You know, most people wind up becoming intermittent workers, et cetera, even with really well-designed programs. Uh, and I think that, you know, that's, that's a really big deal. So when you're thinking about this kind of hardcore of people who are isolated, who are in entrenched poverty, um, you know, that matters in terms of how do we engage them with the broader society and much else. I mean, to me, this seems like a really big think issue because is it possible that that constituency, that marginalized constituency, is going to get bigger over time? When Josh went to 60,000 uh, feet, <laughs> you know, he was talking about a few of these kind of big trends, and one thing that a lot of people have a lot of anxiety about is, for example, the way that automation is going to interact with the depopulation, the way that automation is likely to interact with larger demographic changes. Uh, you know, it happens that we have a lot of people, uh, let's say in the tourism sector and agribusiness, many other sectors, who believe it's absolutely critical to have more less skilled labor. The trouble is that you know, these are certain domains of the economy that are uh, you know, potentially automatable, some of them more than others. Uh, and weirdly, that almost never figures into our conversation about these things. It's also true that 15% of the workforce right now is foreign born, and that slice is way less likely to have high levels of literacy and numeracy than the rest of the population. We love to talk about high skilled immigrants. They're great, we need more of them, but there's another big constituency here. That's a reason why one out of seven adults in the United States has a low level of literacy and numeracy. In Japan, not exactly a super well-functioning place in fairness, but it's one in 25. That means there are certain challenges that we have that a lot of other places don't. That doesn't mean we can hand wave it away, but it does mean that when we're thinking about you know, these larger questions relating to tax policy, we've got to think about the way that the country is changing. Let me respond to my brother from another mother here on, on that one point just quickly, which is, which is that uh, one of the biggest incentives for increased automation is high taxes and high regulations. So for example, uh, one of the trends you see now is a lot of restaurants uh, taking your order automatedly through a computer, through a, a remote, uh, remote entry. Why do they do that? To save labor costs. Why do they try to save labor costs? Because of minimum wage laws, because of Obamacare's employer mandate, which requires you to offer those people highly uh, costly health insurance. And so a lot of these things around tax reform and regulation, these classic, uh, the boring old ideas, are actually driving automation. And so the more we can actually, actually eliminate barriers to employing people in more flexible employment arrangements with less regulation and less requirements, you're going to be able to uh, uh, take up some of that so that's a fair point. The only thing I'll note is that you know, in the 50s, you had European governments import people they thought were workers, and lo and behold, it turns out they were people with other needs, right? And if you're low skilled in this generation, chances are that your children are less likely to have high skills too, you know what I mean? So there are knock-on consequences, right, but it's a fair I, point. I want to get, to, I yeah, wanna get I, Megan in on the you conversation know, I, I think that uh, your point about regulation is dead on, and I think that that's something that, that Republicans, but I mean, when I, look, when I look at what the Tea Party is talking about, when I like, Lots of people at think tanks are talking about bad regulation. How many people in the political base are talking about it? That's a mistake. And I would love to see not just boilerplate, right, about um, uh, 
oh, we should free entrepreneurs, right? Like, we should free entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs should be like floating around freely wherever they wish to go, running through fields of daisies, all the rest of it. Um, but here's the thing, you need, like the great thing about Reagan, I was just watching uh, Reagan's uh, speech for Goldwater's campaign, but mm -hmm. also his, his speeches, you know what was great about them? They were specific. And they actually spoke to people uh, in terms of specific things that the government was doing wrong in regulation. And that is, I think, why he went in with the political capital to continue the deregulation that Jimmy Carter, God bless him, had started. Um, and, and you know, there was a period when that had really broad support in the want class, but also where Reagan managed to get people fired up about it. He managed to actually make this an interesting topic. Republicans have stopped making that an interesting topic, and so there's been a natural tendency to revert to talk about something that everyone does, which is pay taxes. And I would love to see Republicans get back to a real serious, focused, actually politically motivating as well as wonkily motivating uh, focus on, on everything from, you know, the, the licensing laws at the local level. We all hate them. I mean, right, but there's a lot of stuff out there. I'd love to see people start talking about, look, even when regulations are good, they add complexity and complexity is bad. And so we have to think about, you know, do we cap regulations? If you want a new one, you have to get rid of an old one. Not because that regulation is bad, but because at some level it becomes impossible to run a small business because you cannot know whether you're in compliance. It becomes impossible to do many things simply because you cannot, without expensive expert help, even find out if you're able to do it. And so that I would love to see people really tackling, but they, they, they have not so I'm looking higher. covetously at those water bottles, by the way. They just look so <laughs> tempting there. I, I, I think a, a big challenge. challenge with that, though, is that at the federal level, a lot of the low-hanging fruit has been picked. I mean, Jimmy Carter deregulated the airline industry and allowed microbrewing and all these things, and we sort of got rid of a lot of the really dumb federal business regulations in the 70s and 80s. Left. No, it's, it's mostly at the state and local level. It's the licensing stuff. Yeah. It's regulations of land use. Let and it's push, difficult to build a, a federal let me push agenda back on that. around So that. My, dad was, yeah. my dad was a lobbyist, and the supreme irony of my life is a libertarian journalist. <laughs> and what he lobbied for was uh, infrastructure projects. And they estimate uh, that adding federal money to a project adds five years to that project's completion. And that is all because of the, the, pro the bidding process, which is unbelievably screwed up. Uh, the EPA, which is pretty thoroughly captured by the consumer groups and doesn't really care how much it slows down your project or et cetera, um, and, and other agencies like that that have basically been captured by interests other than actually making things happen. Um, and that is a big deal and that could certainly be addressed at the federal level. I agree, there's a ton of stuff at, at state and local, but I also think that like the stuff that was easy for everyone to agree on has been done at the federal level, right. but that does not mean it has all been done. The Competitive Enterprise Institute uh, does an annual survey of the total cost of, of federal regulations. Actually, I think it's federal, state, and local, but they also break it out. And I think the total now is $1 trillion a year in terms of the cost of complying, the economic cost of complying with these regulations. And if you just measure it in terms of the number of pages in the Federal Register, they've exploded over the last uh, 10, 15 years. And a lot of that's because of new laws like the Affordable Care Act, the Clean Air Act, and the Clean Water Act uh, from the Bush, the George H.W. Bush eras. Uh, had a lot to do with it. Um, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. But I also problem. think Josh's point is that to some degree when you're thinking about the labor market and the barriers to entry, a lot of that action is the state and local level. The federal issues are absolutely important, as I think Josh would agree. But just in terms of moving the needle on mobility stuff, I think that that's stuff that's hard for national politicians in a presidential campaign or whatever to talk about coherently without having a jumble of like federal coercive mandates or whatever else. Let me try to connect just a couple dots. Um, uh, I think. Megan, your comment that entrepreneurs should be allowed to run through fields of daisies and those sorts of things is a, an applause line for, um, <laughs> for this audience. Uh, but and as we connect it to, to regulation in particular, um, I mean, there are, there are a lot of negative signs that almost point to a secular decline uh, in, in the US with regards to entrepreneurship and business dynamism. Uh, new companies made up roughly half of all American businesses in 1982 versus basically a, a third today. Uh, the number of young technology companies has fallen roughly 30% since uh, early in, in the 2000s. 
there's something going on here. I and mean, we've, we've talked about corporate issues and the corporate uh, tax code, but as we think about startups and we think about uh, entrepreneurship and, and, and think also through the lens of, of regulation, uh, is this a, a, a likely big theme as we move out into 2016? Are there ideas uh, to help address uh, what, what appears to be a, a pretty alarming uh, trend line? I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's I, others I, too. Yeah, I, I, I partially wrote a book about this whole thing, so <laughs> why it's happening. Uh, and one of the reasons it's happening is we're getting old. Old people don't start companies. Um, you know, if there, there's a payoff matrix, right? If you start a company when you're 25 and it succeeds, you have 70 years, you know, 60, 70 years to be rich. If you start a company when you're 65, now that's not to say no one can do it. Colonel Sanders founded Kentucky Fried Chicken at the age of 65, although in fairness, he was broke in his truck stop and was put out of business by the state of Kentucky. Um, but it's a great story. Uh, one of my favorite stories uh, about entrepreneurship. But um, in general, right, the payoff is just lower. Also, older people actually seem to be secularly brain change or whatever. They're actually less risk loving. It may have something to do with the decline of testosterone, which seems to make young men behave like idiots. Uh, <laughs> and unfortunately, starting a business is great for the economy. It's a really stupid thing to do. You're, you're, you're very likely to fail. You should all go start companies, though. Um, <laughs> and, and so that's part of it. There's also, I think, a decline in risk appetite, and I think that has something to do with the way we're raising kids. They're increasingly, increasingly uh, shielding them from risk. And one of the interesting things is that you would think that, like, for example, keeping kids off high jungle gyms so they can't have falls then they wouldn't be afraid of falling, but actually the kids who are kept down are more afraid of falling than the kids who have bad falls. Um, and, and so I think that, that that leads into it. I think there's a regulatory component. I think there's a tax component. I think that there's a, a risk environment component, which is that when things are bad, you kind of cling to whatever you have, like a deranged limpet, rather than trying to move out and find something new. I mean, I think it's hard to think of that separately from the fact that we've also, we're in this period where large companies have been reluctant to invest. Um, you have all this, you know, all this cash available in the economy and a lack of appealing business opportunities. And I think that's about a, you know, a weak outlook for worldwide economic growth. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, you know, you can, you can tinker with that on the, on the policy level in the United States, um, but I think it sort of goes back to these larger worldwide economic factors that in many cases are not even amenable to policy. Um, but I want to actually, on, I think it's a great comment to, to think more in terms of the global economy and sort of forces within the economy. You made a, uh, a pretty strong case for focusing on the labor market here, right, as a sort of first principle for, uh, for policy action. Uh, you sort of laid out the problem but didn't yeah. really highlight some specific solutions or ideas that you find attractive. Well, so I, th I it's... I think it's difficult to figure out exactly what to do. I mean, I think first of all, monetary policymakers around the world ought to focus more on unemployment and less, and less on keeping inflation down. They've done too good a job of keeping inflation down over the last seven years, much to the detriment of ordinary citizens in the US and especially the Eurozone. Um, I think that we overly focus on pushing people into the labor market. In some cases, we want to um, allow people to make arrangements for their lives that may involve working less, especially parents. Um, I think one of the positive economic effects of the Affordable Care Act has been a partial delinking of, um, of work from health insurance. So you have some people who were working principally because that was the only affordable for, way for them to get health insurance, and now some people can retire at 63 instead of waiting for Medicare at 65. Some parents who could afford to work part-time if they were able to get health insurance through ex an exchange are able to do that. I would like to see a more aggressive delinking of, um, of health insurance from work. I think if you eliminated the employer mandate um, in the Affordable Care Act, that would encourage more employers to drop health insurance, and that would ultimately be a good thing for the economy because it would be one less lever of power that employers have over workers. Um, but I think, it's a, I, I think it's a challenging question. I don't think anybody has a really full accounting um, a lot of people on the left like to point back to the 1950s and talk about high wage growth and low unemployment, and they, they point to, to high union density back then. I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that Europe had basically just blown itself up and we got to sell them a new copy of everything they used to have. Um, so I, I don't, there's a lot that was admirable about the labor market in the 1950s and the 1960s. I don't know that there's much that we can do to replicate it. Um, you touched on health care, and I, I uh, uh, there may be some national exhaustion with regards to healthcare as 
uh, a national uh, issue given you know the the last few years and the ACA and 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 so forth. But uh, you know, healthcare is 17 some odd percent of GDP today. Uh, it's still on a projection, projected sort of incline to get to high 20s over the coming decades. Uh, it's, uh, it's still a, a, a fundamental issue. And uh, I thought maybe I'd get a, a sense maybe from you, Ovik, because I know that you've, you've done a lot of work in this area, to get a sense of your expectation for where sort of the health reform debate uh, will go over the next two years and sort of how central do you think it will be and, and if it is central then um, maybe preview some of the, um, what do you think are the, are the key debates or the key micro fights? Yeah, well first let me uh, underline uh, the, the point you prefaced your question with which is that uh, the high cost of healthcare in the United States is one of the biggest, of course I'm biased because I work on it, <laughs> but uh, I would argue it is, it is the biggest if not one of the biggest problems uh, that we face as a country. Uh, someone asked a question in the last session about uh, the high cost of higher education, which is obviously something you all uh, understandably care about a lot. Uh, and, and a lot of the same perverse incentives have driven up the cost of health care. That is to say, if, uh, say, your local business school, uh, uh, you can, people know that people, the demand for business school places is so high, and there's a certain way to finance that at a subsidi subsidized rate, and people are going to continue to apply to business school and pay. Well, people just pay, and the people who can't afford just don't go. And colleges raise their tuitions by 6 8% a year forever, uh, and that's why there's been massive inflation in the cost of higher education, which is a huge barrier to social uh, mobility. The same things are happening in healthcare. So basically, since the government started heavily subsidizing the cost of healthcare for upper-income people, uh, through the uh, tax break for employer-sponsored health insurance. By the way, Harvey Golub said that the largest tax break uh, in the code was for the mortgage interest deduction. That's not true. The largest tax break in the code is for employer-sponsored health insurance, which is not taxable, not just at the income tax level uh, at the federal, state, and local, but also the payroll tax level, so Social Security and Medicare tax. That costs $532 billion a year in lost revenue to various government entities, which is multiples larger than the mortgage interest tax deduction. Uh, so that's a huge problem because imagine this is these are high income people who are basically being incentivized to have twenty thousand dollars say of their compensation being directed towards health insurance instead of to salary to wages and as a result people are spending a lot more money on health insurance than they really need to and that has encouraged doctors and hospitals to charge a lot more for their services because they know no one is really directly paying for it. It's like an open bar uh, at, the, at the Adam Smith Society, right? You don't really care <laughs> about the price of the bourbon uh, or, or wine that you're drinking. You just know it's, it's coming down to you. And so this has huge problems for everything. It's the biggest driver of our deficit and our debt. It's one of the biggest barriers to economic mobility because the cost of health insurance and health care is crushing lower middle income families and low income families. Uh, and it's, it's, a big, it's a big problem, obviously, for, uh, for the economy because a lot of costs are being drained uh, by, for employers and in terms of hiring and employing people in the United States versus other countries is uh, the biggest labor cost, big part of labor cost is the cost of health care. So that's why this is an issue is so important. What do you do about it? What I've argued in a plan that we put out at the Manhattan Institute last August called Transcending Obamacare is the way to solve this problem is actually through market-based universal coverage which is to say what we do in America is upside down to what every other country does. We massively subsidize health insurance for upper income people and for upper income elderly people through Medicare. Uh, and we don't really do a good job of helping lower income people uh, get health insurance. So if we actually had a true safety net where we subsidized health insurance for low income people to buy whatever health insurance they needed or use a health savings account, but stopped subsidizing health coverage for upper income people. If we just flip that around, and we can do it very gradually over time, uh, then we could actually achieve, we could spend a fraction of what we spend in terms of federal spending and state spending on health care, and also create incentives to lower the cost of health care, because all of a sudden, because consumers will be paying for that care directly, they'll demand more transparency, they'll demand lower prices, they'll demand innovation, they'll demand value. Um, uh, just one follow-up, and, and I, I think it'll take us um, in an interesting direction, hopefully. Um, uh, how much of the innovation on healthcare from a policy perspective do you see really, again, forecasting off into the future uh, at the federal level as opposed to the state level? Um, uh, is there, you know, should we, should we be looking to different states for uh, innovative solutions that are going to really 
provide the context right for the next debate and so forth. It would be nice to see uh, more state level innovation. It's very hard because the federal government has done so much for so many decades to dominate the space in terms of healthcare. There's just very little room for governors to do a lot in healthcare. Basically, what the governors are left to do in our system is tinker around the edges of Medicaid, which is a federal entitlement right. created by the Great Society, and tweak it a little bit. Um, that may change. There's a Supreme Court case where oral arguments are going to be heard next week called King v. Burwell. Uh, in which uh, the legality of federal subsidies for the federal exchange in Obamacare uh, may be ruled illegal because they don't comply with what the law actually says. If that's true, you're going to have 34 to 37 states that all of a sudden don't have their subsidies for their uh, Obamacare insurance markets. And that could be an opportunity uh, if Congress uh, puts in the right patch for states to have a lot more latitude to, uh, to innovate in terms of how they design their health insurance market. So that's, that's one thing that's out there that could, could change the equation. But without real reform at the federal level, you're not going to get there. But I know Kate's been doing some work on this, too. No, so I, I mean, um, uh, I guess it's a little depressing, right, that there isn't more uh, health care innovation from a policy perspective going on at the states. I was hopeful, actually, to bring in others in the discussion, because um, I do think uh, a lot of folks are looking to states as innovation labs uh, with regards to policy, and I think it's likely to play uh, a big role in, uh, in 2016 and beyond. So pivoting away from, from healthcare for a second, I was hopeful that um, uh, maybe it's Megan, Josh, and others could, could highlight um, some state-based policies that could be models for other states or even for the federal government. Well, I, I think a, the primary importance of this issue is not that it's a drag on productivity, but it is a drag on productivity, which is that we imprison way too many people in the United States. Um, it's also highly disruptive to communities, especially black communities and lower income communities around the country, um, taking so many prime age men who ought to be working um, and raising families, instead putting them in, in prison. And I think there's been a real shift in a lot of the states toward recognizing that they've over incarcerated. Partly it was driven by the fiscal crises that happened in the last few years. So we'll see now that states have more tax revenue coming in, whether they are still trying to you know, Im imprison fewer people. Um, but I think, I think there are real opportunities there to make smarter choices about criminal justice that uh, um, strengthen communities and ultimately strengthen the economy, too. I think that that's right, and it, but I think that it, it goes beyond just saying, like, we're going to not put so many people in jail. Although, and that, and that actually is the primary driver. It's, it's entry into the right. prison system, and that has slowed down. But um, what I actually think is exciting at the state level, most exciting at the state level, because you know, I sort of st I went to see Hawaii's prison system uh, a couple years ago for my book, and I sort of started out with a basic libertarian, like it's all nonviolent drug offenders, et cetera. It's not. Like people who are in the prison system are there because they did something we really don't approve of and that they should not have done. Um, <laughs> like there, there are some people who are there for selling drugs, but most of them are there because they assaulted someone or raped someone or robbed them or they, and, and, but that said, people are valuable people make mistakes, they can be rehabilitated. And so the focus on that, um, changing how we approach that, and, and there are a bunch of different ways that I think I'll, I'll name three. One is this kind of very high focus where you go in and it's easier to keep something low crime than to make it low crime. And so you focus on a small group and say, look, look, I don't care what's going on over there. If any of you guys offend, you are going to jail. We are watching you. And once you get those guys down to a lower level of crime, you move on to the next people. And that that's, uh, the second is something called swift and certain, which is 24-7 uh, sobriety in North Dakota, uh, Project Hope, which is coming out of Hawaii but now moving across the United States, where basically instead of saying, as uh, Mark Kleiman, who's a public policy professor, says, uh, nothing, 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 bam, you're going to jail for 10 years. Prison, sorry, prison. This is a distinction that I learned about when I went to see the prison system. They laughed at me. Um, but uh, instead you say you're going to jail for like three days every time you do something, every single time. With 24-7 sobriety, if you have uh, more than one DUI, you have to go and blow a breathalyzer twice a day at the police station. And if you fail or you don't show up, they put you in jail for a few days, not forever. But that kind of, in the same way that we treat kids or dogs, right? Like, <laughs> which is a second, yes, I know it's paternalistic, but look, it, it, changing people's behavior patterns, people can stay sober in front of a cop if they have to. Um, and so people who have previously shown inability to make good choices, kind of forcing them to make good choices until they get onto a better 
path of life. Um, and the third is these um, monitoring technologies, is allowing people to have house arrest. It's not ideal, but it is certainly less expensive and also better in terms of like someone who is at home is someone who can provide childcare or see their kid or help their mom around the house. They're, they're actually doing something. They can go to work if, they're, if, if it's appropriate. Those things are really changing how we're incarcerating people so that it's not just that we say we're not going to prosecute people for burglary anymore, which is kind of the approach that we took in the 70s, uh, but instead that, no, like we take crime seriously and we're going to get it down, but we're not going to get it down by like coming in and smiting your life for the rest of your life, right? Like Zeus throwing lightning bolts from the mountain. Instead, we're actually going to try to help you get back onto the path to being a good citizen. That's great. Um, just very quickly on the criminal justice point, I actually feel like it's very useful as an illustration of some larger principles. So one thing is that state governments are actually really bad at being innovative and experimental, uh, I would argue. Partly because you know, there's this incredible convergence because of the federal government, because of federal regulation, because the way that in education, for example, 12% you know, of the dollars come from the federal government, yet they exert way more than 12% of the control because you have state education bureaucracies that administer this you know, relatively small sum of federal money, and that winds up actually controlling what people do. So that convergence is actually a huge problem if what you want is state-level policy innovation. And the reason why I think that criminal justice is a good example um, of this larger phenomenon is that you have these crazily misaligned incentives. There's this guy named William Stuntz, who sadly now dead, but he wrote a great book called The Collapse of American Criminal Justice. And one of the things he talks about is very, very simple. Uh, prisons are paid for by state governments. Police are paid for mainly by local governments. So the thing is, if you're trying to figure out, should I spend more on crime control and crime prevention, or should I just you know, not spend that much on that, but then throw a lot of people in jail to deter people, you might actually have a futzed up decision because those incentives are misaligned. Or similarly, you have county prosecutors who are, it seemed to be, putting a lot of people in jail now, post-1991, that they wouldn't have put in jail in earlier eras. Well, there's one idea that why don't we have county level crime control budgets. And you're saying, hey, you're going to be accountable for the incarceration costs to some degree. Or you can devote those resources in some other way, too. Actually, aligning these incentives in a smarter way was the whole point of having competitive federalism. And when you have grant and aid programs, when you have a program like Medicaid, where I have to cut $2 to get $1 in savings at the state level, or similarly, when you think about policing, um, you know, part of it is policing can be legitimacy depleting. If I'm doing stop and frisk, it might be good because I'm going to have less gun crime, but it could be legitimacy depleting in the sense the people in that community trust me less. So that means that down the line when I'm trying to investigate a crime and I'm actually trying to build up trust in the system. So I think that this is the way we need to think about it. And I actually believe that a competitive federalism is actually the right way to go about this. And people will come to the right conclusions because they have the incentives to come to the right conclusions. And that's why this is centrally important, but basically really, really, really hard to do. No, thank you very much. I, I want to I leave time for questions from the audience. I think we're going to do questions not with a mic going around. So if you have questions, if you could stand up and walk over to uh, the standing mic there. Uh, this, aud the, this panel would love to. And uh, there's one on this side as well. This panel would love to take, um, take some questions from the audience. Uh, don't be shy. I think you unfortunately have to get up. Sorry about that. And please state uh, just your name and, and your affiliation in your school. Victor Makarov, uh, Chicago Booth. Uh, should we have a consumption tax or an income tax? Thank you. Nice and straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's, an, if it's an either or, you know, then I think or, the or would be a consumption tax. But of course, it's not an either or. And that's why there is no consumption tax at the federal level. Uh, one thing, actually, that's interesting on this question is that we hear a lot of talk about you know, the rich paying their fair share in terms of the individual uh, income tax code. Uh, we have, the United States has the most progressive income tax uh, code in the OECD, in the industrialized world, largely because we don't have a federal uh, value added tax, whereas most other countries do, and therefore th uh, the tax burden at the individual level in those countries is more broadly distributed than it is in the United States. A, a consumption tax is more economically efficient than an income tax. The, the problem is you also need to have a tax with a, a base that is sufficient to finance the government and that is sufficiently progressive. That it's difficult to design. Con, a consumption tax is almost always going to be less progressive than an income tax. Even if you do, I mean, you, first of all, people talk about consumption taxes, they think of VATs. 
You can also have a consumption tax that is filed in the manner of the income tax. You just allow people to deduct all the income that they didn't consume. You could have essentially IRA accounts with no restrictions on, on deposits and withdrawals. So that would certainly be a better way of doing it than doing a value added tax. Um, one, there, there are two distributional problems with that. One is that wealth, the wealthiest people tend to earn a lot more income than they consume. And the other thing is that it's often difficult to measure consumption. For example, you know, when you own a home, you are engaging in consumption every year that you live in and enjoy that home, but that income is not taxed in part because of, you know, the people don't think of imputed rental income as real income and in part because it's difficult to measure. So it's likely if you shift to a consumption tax, you're going to end up with a tax that, that shifts the tax burden toward people with relatively lower incomes, which in addition to, I think, probably not being just as a political non-starter. We've seen several successions of Republican presidential campaigns coming out with plans that are focused around cutting marginal rates at the top, and then people sort of discover to their shock every four years that that involves shifting the tax burden down toward the middle class, um, and I think you, the, that's not something you're going to sell to the country. Uh, yeah, thanks. Jake Madison from Cornell. Uh, my question revolves around re regulation. Um, today, it seems like Republicans, conservatives in general, are not really defending the banks at all as far as their ability to take on any kind of risky lending. Uh, the first thing we learn in finance is that reward is directly correlated to risk. So when you remove risk, there goes your return. Uh, we also talk about entrepreneurship, but we all learn that venture capital is the riskiest asset class there is. How do we educate the population that in order to have return and to have growth, you have to take on risk? Well, subject you could start. <laughs> it's the subject of my book. It's a hard sell. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's uh, people, especially like what you see after a traumatic event is that people kind of want to curl in and not take risks, even if that, that's not smart. Um, and I think that you are seeing that reaction. There's also a kind of general temptation to blame people. Um, you know, I have, I have now spent six years trying to sell the notion that maybe the market just went haywire and no one really did anything they knew was wrong. And like that is, I can't tell you the things people have screamed at me when I suggested that. Um, like there, there's a very deep-seated human belief that if something went wrong, someone must have done it. That it did, things don't just happen, right? Uh, we don't like chaos and so we imagine it out of our world picture. And the end result, and you know, and in fairness, also look, bankers make a huge amount of money, and uh, many of them are my friends from business school, but they weren't really very repentant, and that was a mistake. They were all whining about how hard it was that their bonuses had got cut in half, and they had these big mortgages on New York apartments, and everyone else was like, right, so I lost my business, and I'm about to lose my home, and have to go live in a trailer. Why am I going to feel sorry for you? Um, the banks did not learn the, the ancient secret of shutting up fast enough, um, and I think that that hurt them. Um, and, you know, but I also think that there's a third thing, which is actually just that they were getting excess returns in the lead up to 20, 2008. People were making money uh, for being dumb. I mean, I don't think that they were blameworthy, but they were dumb. They were investing a bunch of money in dumb asset classes that, had they included the default variable in their credit models, would have produced very different buy recommendations than they gave themselves. Um, and that the, the profits are draining out of finance, at least in the United States. And I think that that is likely to be the case from now on. And I think to go back to what Josh says, the cost of that normally you would say, well, I mean, for one thing, we have a very competitive finance market and we make a lot of money off of it and we're going to lose some of that market share abroad. Um, but the normal cost of that is that it's harder to get capital to invest. But what it, we're actually seeing is it's hard to get businesses to invest. They're just like amassing these giant piles of cash and sitting on top of them like Scrooge McDuck. Um, and so at this point, I'm not sure how high the cost is. If we get back to a point where businesses are finding productive projects to invest in, then the, the dearth of capital is going to be a real problem. But right now, the big problem is that no one seems to have productive projects that they want to. And maybe they're out there, but they are not identifying and investing in them. As someone who worked in the uh, private equity uh, hedge fund business for a dozen years, I, I think it's really important to make huge, very important distinction between what the interests of the banks are and what the interests of uh, the finance industry are. They're not exactly the same. So, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, 
these banks have a massive competitive advantage because of their effectively too big to fail status, which allows them to borrow money uh, at a, an advantage low interest rate relative to other financial institutions. And they take advantage of that regulatory institutional power uh, in a way that's, that's not capitalism. That's not risk adjusted returns and risk reward and freedom. That's crony capitalism. Uh, I, I forg you know, forgive me to any of you who are gonna be working there uh, this summer, but, uh, but, that's, <laughs> but that's what it is. And I think plenty of people in the finance industry uh, particularly people who invest in the, in the financial sector, are incredibly frustrated by this. So if you actually really want to have a system where there's risk and reward, we have to make sure that the banking system is much more competitive than it is. What we have today are these quasi-state funded and state uh, uh, regulated entities that aren't actually capitalist entities. So if you want, if you want to have, if you want to say we should uh, defend the finance industry more because it's capitalist, well, no, it's not. If you want to defend the finance industry, let's ma actually make it capitalist, and then we can talk about saluting the great capitalists in the finance industry. I'm going to keep getting through questions. I don't know who was first standing up. Um, you want to go, and then we'll come here. John Keither, Kellogg School of Management. Um, a lot of you mentioned upward mobility as kind of the key thing we need to address. Wondering if you can tie that together with um, social safety net programs and how can we reform those in order to better, better improve upward mobility? Yeah, so I, I think this is extremely important. And a big part of what we have to do is we actually have to have a philosophical conversation on the right about the moral value of the safety net. So on the right, there's this incredible tension between those who say there's no legitimate role for the government to actually have a safety net. Then there are the pragmatists who say, well, we think we should continue to have a safety net because if we don't, we'll lose elections. And then I think there's those, including a number of the people on this stage, who say, actually, if you read Hayek, if you think about the longer conservative tradition, uh, there is actually an inherent value to a safety net. If we want to have equal opportunity for all, that means ensuring that we have opportunity. That's, there's a certain amount of state intervention that's necessary to achieve equal opportunity for all. That's, for example, why we have public schools, so that people who are poor have the opportunity to get an education and rise up. I would argue the same is true for health care. It's also true for a, a lot of other things. And again, there are a lot of people in this, uh, on the this stage who, uh, who can make that case. But I think that's a philosophical conversation on the right we have not had, and we absolutely have to have that. Go ahead. I, I agree, and I, but I think in the meantime, there are little bit by bit things that you can do in that Social Security's disability insurance program will become insolvent next year, and the only reason anybody is talking about doing anything is because it's running out of money really soon. Um, so I think that as these things start to come up, you can start to kind of discuss them, and I don't know in the case of disability insurance if that's ever really going to be a reality, but I think the things to look at are what's in the worst shape and how do we fix them? In the case of disability insurance, the problem is, is that people never, uh, that less than 1% of benefit recip recipients each year ever go back into the workforce and that multiple injuries combined can, so there are all of these rules that changing some of these rules could have huge impact. So I understand that you know, having a philosophical conversation will be important, but I also think that there are small um, nitpicky kind of bit by, things, bit by bit things that can be done in the meantime. I think it's sort of interesting that we had a question about getting people comfortable with the idea that you need risk for return and then a question about the safety net. Because I think these are very connected issues. This is something that Scandinavia has gotten a lot smarter than Southern Europe. Where you, like in Denmark, you have a very flexible labor market and they say we're going to have generous benefits to support people who lose their job. We're going to let employers, you know, hire and fire as they wish. And in Southern Europe, you have a somewhat less expansive welfare state and you have a much more regulated labor market. But I think they go hand in hand. I think if you, know, if you want people to say, well, sometimes the economy is going to go up and sometimes it's going to go down, and that's how capitalism and the reallocation of capital works, you need as part of that deal something where they, they know they're going to be protected. But that you, know, you can still have a lot of reform within that context. I agree that SSDI is a, is a problematic program. But I think you know, it's a problematic program in part because it's a really difficult thing to get right. A, lot of, a huge amount of SSDI is back problems and mental health problems, which are difficult to diagnose. And it often ends up being sort of a matter of opinion, whether somebody you know, has too much back pain to work or not. And I think conservatives sometimes, I don't mean people in this room, but I mean elected Republican politicians, sort of have a lot of rhetoric about how you know, the government's bad and too expensive and don't want to get in the weeds on these, you know, we need a program like this. It's going to cost a fair amount of money to do it. How do we do it in, a, in an efficient way 
um, that is both politically sustainable and that incur you know encourages employers and workers to work together to accommodate them instead of pushing them out of the way. Ask okay. anyone who says they want to abolish the Department of Education if they want to abolish funding for disabled students, funding for autism, or any of the other funding that the Department of Education actually oversees. They're literally saying that we should abolish this thing called the Department of Education and not touch anything that it actually does. And then when you have people who say, what should we actually do with these things that we actually do and are not going to get rid of, then they're like, you're a communist. And it's <laughs> really interesting and, and frankly kind of an embarrassment. Yeah, I think Republicans and Democrats each have what I think of as the imaginary poor person. And the imaginary Republican poor person is someone who basically spends all of their life thinking about nothing but how they are going to get someone else to pay them lavish government benefits so they don't have to work. And the imaginary Democratic poor person is the person who never does that. And like, you know, like I've had Democrats tell me flat out that like people, people don't stay on unemployment benefits uh, ever just because they don't want to work. Like I know people who have done this. Like I have spoken to them. You are telling me that I've imagined, right, like large expanses of, uh, of my personal life, right? Like uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, but like, you know, and, and so you end up with a system that is functionally kind of designed to, uh, to cater to both of these beliefs rather than understanding this as a kind of complicated thing where if you have bad incentives, it doesn't mean that you have bad people. It just means that the incentives are bad and that you can be encouraging, as I think welfare did, encouraging people to make bad short-term, totally rational short-term decisions that are really terrible long-term decisions. The reason Absolutely. why... Right, and, and, and that I think is actually something that Republicans need to reframe. Is like, look, this is not about whether people are cheating the unemployment system or the disability system, whatever. It's like, are we encouraging people to do something that in the short term is the easiest thing to do, which is to stop looking for work and stay on benefit, but which in the long term is gonna hurt them more? It's a great question. I think we could have had an entire panel Sorry. on <laughs> mobility and, and the safety net. My apologies. I'm, I'm getting the sign to unfortunately wrap up, uh, but maybe afterwards we can step to the side and answer those questions. Um, thank you, everybody, for, um, uh, for listening, I think, to a, a fantastic uh, panel. Uh, thank our panelists for, uh, for coming today and, and, uh, and being so articulate on all these different issues. Thank you. Thank you.